Sweet dreams are made of this. <laughs> Everything started with me and a couple of my buddies hanging out at my place. For sake of this story, I will name my two friends Michael and Lucas. Basically, everyone got pretty much wasted from drinking too much cheap bourbon Michael had brought with him. It was around 2am when Lucas, still a bit drunk, suggested we should go and explore the abandoned insane asylum. For context, we all live together in the same small town. There is not much going on there. But when you drive about 15 miles on empty back roads, you should come across the old mental hospital, which has been vegetating ever since it was abandoned in the 1960s due to unknown reasons. So since there was really nothing better to do, we all agreed to the 30 minute drive. We grabbed our backpacks, some water, three flashlights and a big hunting knife for protection. Lucas also brought a couple of graffiti cans for obvious reasons. Yeah, he was into that stuff at the time. The drive was relatively unspectacular, with the exception that Michael almost ran over a rattlesnake lying in the middle of the road. When we arrived, the sight of this huge asylum just standing there for all these years made me feel a little uneasy. But my doubts quickly evaporated as Michael and Lucas were already going around the place looking for an entrance. We finally found a window that was not completely boarded up with beams and then crawled head first through the small opening. I quickly got on my feet and let my eyes get adjusted to the darkness that completely surrounded us. We powered up our flashlights and began wandering through the corridors with rooms on either sides. The walls were pretty much all covered in graffiti, so Lucas suggested that we should look out for a basement entrance, with the intention of finding a free spot for his graffiti. After a 30 minute search we finally found the basement entrance. The stairs were rusty and creaked with every step. The whole basement smelled terrible. Lucas quickly disappeared down a long hallway with rooms on either side. Michael and I kept pace up behind him. As we wandered off further into the dark hallway, which our cheap flashlights only poorly lit up, the terrible smell grew even worse. I can only describe it as a mixture of vomit and rotten eggs. What struck me as odd was that the walls were pretty much clean. Unlike the site we made at the first floor, it almost seemed like nobody had ever made it all the way to explore the basement level. Everything was going relatively smooth, up until the point when Lucas started making much noise by shaking his graffiti cans in order to prepare them for his act of vandalism. So he started spray painting one of the nearby walls. Michael and I just watched him do his thing. When he finally finished his piece, the smell of aerosol in the air almost drowned out the horrible stink that was still in the air. As we made our way down the hallway, I could tell that the smell came from a small room further down to the left of us. At this point, we were all pretty much freaking out. What would we find in that room? I had the hunting knife tight in my hands as I approached the room and shined my flashlight inside. The light beam hit, and I kid you not, a circle of burned out candles. In the center of the candles was a dark object hanging from the ceiling. At this point, I had to vomit because of the smell coming from this room. Michael was the bravest one of us, as he stumbled into the room, grabbing a metal bar from the pile of junk next to him, poking the object with it. As right then, we realized there was a huge amount of dark brownish stains on the floor under the thing. We all quickly sobered up due to the situation, as we heard several voices and fast approaching footsteps from across the other hallway. I never ran that fast in my entire life. It's really amazing the effect that adrenaline can have. We finally reached the set of stairs and sprinted through the floor. As we finally reached the window we had entered from, Michael also vomited onto the floor. Lucas then realized that he had left his backpack full of his stuff in the basement, as he had not enough time to pick it up. We sprinted out front and got into my car and hightailed it out there. As far as I know, we only have suggestions of what we saw in the basement. Maybe there was some kind of ritual taking place there, or we had just stumbled across a murder scene. We haven't told anybody this story. In fact, Lucas told me that he had not had a good night's sleep since that day 
knowing that he left his wallet in his backpack there, keeping all his personal information, including his home address. I have a story from about two years ago that really captivates me to this day. When I've told this story to close friends, they tell me it's straight out of a movie. I really can't disagree with that. This starts when I finished my first year of college in the Bay Area. I worked my ass off in school and just wanted to have a wild summer and I would do anything I could to get out of the house. My cousin was and is my best friend and we basically did anything and everything together. When there wasn't anything to do, we'd take walks together around my rural neighborhood. I always lived near this old hospital which used to operate as the biggest trauma unit in my area. Sometime when I was in high school, they shut the hospital down due to unknown reasons. It basically just sat there rotting for a few years before we found it. One day my cousin and I were drinking a cold one, taking one of our routine walks and ventured away from the usual route through this peaceful, random field. We stumbled across this huge parking lot after making it out of the field, but it didn't hit me that this was the old hospital's parking lot we found. We made our way through the lot until we saw this massively grand building standing outside of the lot. The deteriorated banner said emergency room and this is when we knew we'd struck gold and stumbled across a back route to this abandoned hospital. We knew of this place but we had never been here. We hadn't heard any weird outlandish urban legends nor had anyone we knew been here before us. We pushed forward and checked the perimeter. To our surprise, the first door we walked up to had a rock jammed in between the door frame so we could waltz in. This is when we realized this could potentially be a bad idea if we got caught and we could suffer some consequences. We agreed we would be quiet and respectful and make it a quick trip. This is where things take a turn, or a few turns. We enter the building and it was the most deafening quiet I have ever heard. The sound of the door closing behind us sounded like a literal bombing. Once the echo stopped from the door, it dawned on us that this place was really creepy. We walked slowly, but the floor was covered in glass which made even the smallest steps sound like Bigfoot lumbering around a library. We find a patient room which still has a bed inside. We stop at the doorway and look inside because the floor looks sketchy. Out of nowhere, from around the corner, we hear the faintest, slow, drawn out whistling. I've never in my life stopped what I was doing so suddenly. I just stare, wide eyed at my cousin, because even a whisper sounds like yelling in this place. We both have our feet planted to the ground, because if we move those two, we will make ourselves known. At this point, we both assumed there could potentially be a squatter or guard of some sort. My cousin hand gestures to me that we have to leave and we can't just stand here because the whistling was obviously not going to stop at that point. We turn towards the opposite side of the corner that the whistling is at and are tiptoeing out to a perfect science. Then the whistling stops. We freeze. Then we hear the glass crunching from around the corner. We start running. Once we get to the door we came from we realize we didn't put a rock in the door frame when we came in and the door is completely stuck. As we're trying to get this door to open, the glass crunching is now running. We hear the glass crunching until it sounds like it's dangerously close. I'm horrified. We turn around to try another door and the noise of the glass is literally right in front of us. Yet, no one is there. No one. We book it to a door that says pharmacy and peel open the door. The pharmacy is completely empty except a single perfectly placed and aligned landline phone plugged into the wall. The phone is off the hook and is making a dial tone. The whole thing was perfectly lined up and centered with the whole room. I've never seen anything like it. The dial tone was so loud in such an empty place. There wasn't power throughout the hospital. So how was it working? I was in shock. We left and never went back. I had heard of some other kids going up there at night. They told me they heard the whistling and thought someone was lurking in the shadows the whole time. It's a freaky world out there. So 
So this story takes place around the time of the housing crisis back in 2008 or so. I was in high school at the time. A buddy, I'll call Eric, and myself would do some urban exploring by sneaking into empty, abandoned and foreclosed homes. Of course, we do these explorations in the dead of night to avoid any trouble with the law. I can't give away the location because people live there now, and I have no scientific rational explanation for what happened, but I know what I saw and heard, so I'd like to share it with you all. So we set out around 12am just like we would any other night. About an hour or so in, we find a house that I often saw in my walks to school. As we walk up to the house, we scan for anyone, then we make our way down the large driveway that leads into the backyard of the house. The first thing I noticed is how tall the grass was. Like, it hadn't been mowed in quite some time. Months, I'd say. Then I noticed a smaller house, further, near the back of the property. We told ourselves we'd check that house out once we'd explored the bigger one. We enter the bigger house from the door that leads into the garage, and from the garage, we stepped into the kitchen. Believe it or not, the doors were unlocked. When we entered the kitchen, we saw the house was almost pitch black. We could only see a few feet ahead, thanks to the streetlights. So I used my only light source at the time, a cheap flip phone with the screen brightness on max. We start our exploration down the hallway and check out each room, five in total, counting the two living rooms. Eric is close enough behind me and we make our way through each room and eventually back to the kitchen. Once in the kitchen we chat about how nice the house is and its size given the area it's in, much bigger than the surrounding houses. As we're talking I notice a metal decoration hanging above the kitchen doorway. It almost looked like some sort of decorative shield. I pull it from a spot and inspect it closely. Once done, I can't figure out how to put it back, so I set it between my feet on the tile floor. I take a look at my friend and take a step into the kitchen. Then we both hear what sounds like something sliding along the floor, and then a bang at the end of the hall. Eric and I both freeze and stare at one another, through the street light shining through the kitchen window. Eric whispers to me, is there someone here with us? Did someone follow us in? I honestly didn't know, but after a minute or two we decide to walk down the hall and see what the noise was. As my phone light creeps the end of the wall, we see the shield I had just pulled down. We were both relieved, and I thought, well, maybe I kicked it when I stepped and I didn't notice. I picked it up and this time, I figure out how it needs to be attached to its original position. Once again, I look at Eric and take a step towards him, and I hear a few clangs on the floor, and that familiar sliding sound across the floor and the bang against the wall. Now we're really scared and frozen, not moving for what seemed like forever. Then an even louder bang is heard at the other end of the house, and we both jump and stare into the dark hallway. Then again, bang, and then quiet. Then three rapid bangs. Someone was thrashing around in the very last room in the house, and we didn't know what the hell to do. Determined not to let this person scare us, we ran towards that last room and confronted this asshole. When we get there, nothing. No one. The room was empty, but how? Who? We were sure it was coming from this room. There's no way whoever it was slipped by us. The room had a sliding glass door leading into the backyard, but it was locked from the inside. Then, before we can gather our thoughts and ask each other what was happening, bang, 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 this time from the kitchen. Scared out of my mind, we both agree it's time to leave. We make our way through the back door in the room and finally to the street, all while checking over our shoulders to ensure no one was going to come running out of the house behind us. No one came, and the neighborhood was quiet. Eric and I started our walks home, talking about the house, when Eric notices his pocket knife is missing. He then turns his pockets inside out to show me he isn't joking. We stop, and he keeps telling me we have to go back for it, since it's his favorite one. Frustrated, I ask him, how did you lose it if it's your favorite knife? 
he assures me he never removed it from his pocket and has no idea how it could have been removed from his pocket. I agree to go with him and find it. We make it halfway up the street when Eric tells me his back feels like it's on fire. I can see it's really bothering him because the expression of pain on his face. He asks me to lift his shirt and look at what could be causing the burning sensation. I lift his shirt and quickly notice three very large scratches starting from his right shoulder blade going all the way down to his left hip then from his left hip across to his right hip. I tell him this and he immediately says the house is haunted but he still wants to go get the knife. I'm so scared but I'm not going to let him go alone. So we make our way back into the house and immediately hear that banging noise. But we made a pact with each other that we would not run no matter what happened. We began our search for the knife, looking high and low all while hearing banging. And now, things are being thrown across the room. Of course, I'm scared shitless. I want to leave, but we haven't found the knife yet. We do one pass through the entire house and end up in the kitchen. In the kitchen, there is an entrance to the second living room that you can see from the backyard. In that room, there's one piece of furniture, a hutch. Now, we had already checked this room since it's near our point of entrance and found nothing, but we decided one more pass through the room would not hurt. I made my way into the dark room and let my light lead me to the hutch. And there it is. On the hutch, we found the knife. But for sure, we checked this room and the hutch. He didn't hesitate for a moment. He grabbed the knife and we both hightailed it out of there through the garage and back onto the street. This is far from the end of the story, but to summarize, this house is messed up. The rest of the story includes shadow figures leaping from the bushes, dozens of light bulbs shattering at once, and a knife jammed deep into the front door of the home. Thanks for listening. Update 1. Decided to add more to the post. We make our way back to our homes, but the entire week we would talk about the house and what was going on in there. We brushed it off and didn't believe it. There had to be some explanation, so we go back. We bring three friends with us because they wanted to see this haunted house Eric and I wouldn't shut up about. While walking through the backyard, I can't explain it, but for some reason, I wanted to get a closer look at the back house. I start making my way towards the house, but I start to feel scared. A feeling of dread came out of nowhere. I turn away from the house and start my way back to the group, but at the corner of my eye I saw something leap from the bushes. Some dark figure leaped from the bushes and into the tall grass. But when I gave it my full attention it was gone. I stared at the bushes for a moment, a little confused, but I brushed it off. I did mention it to the group when I caught up with them, but it was quickly dismissed. We enter through the garage door. This time we notice a white bookshelf full of light bulbs in the garage. The bookshelf was probably about 5 feet high and 3 feet wide, completely filled with packaged white bulbs. We study it for a moment and make our way to the kitchen with Eric leading and me in the back. I enter last and shut the kitchen and garage door behind me. As soon as I release the doorknob, we hear what sounded like someone in the garage, breaking all the light bulbs in the bookshelf. Stunned, I remember my heart beating a mile a minute, waiting for whatever the hell it was to start trying to fight its way into the kitchen. But nothing came, and Eric finally said, I guess we're not going back now. We make our way to the very last room in the house, the same room Eric and I had exited through the last time we were there. Whatever it was did not disappoint. Random objects were being thrown against the wall in front of us. We could hear loud banging all throughout the dark house, like there were people fighting in the damn house. One of the friends decides he's had enough and opens a glass door to the backyard, and four of us start making our way through the backyard. I turn around to wait for Eric. He was not moving, caught in a daze, standing in front of an unhinged door that was propped against the wall for support. Eric was staring down the hallway 
as if waiting for something. I had to call his name three times before he realized we were leaving. He stepped forward and before my eyes, it looked as though someone tried to throw the unhinged door on top of him. Eric jumped out of the way and started towards me, scared out of his wits. The other three were already almost to the street, so we both just keep the pace and catch up with them. As soon as we reached the street, one of our friends kept telling us about how messed up that house was. You could see the look of terror on his face as he expressed his feelings about it. He then mentions a burning feeling going up his calf. Sure enough, he's got those same scratches starting from his ankle and stopping midway through his calf. Just before we split up to go home, the three of them swear off that place, and that was the last time those three friends spoke to us. So there's more to come. Unfortunately, I'm on a time constraint, but we'll definitely be telling more of what happened. Again, thanks for listening. Update. Final. We ended up going back to the house a few times after that, but nothing absolutely memorable happened. We heard the knocks and the bangs and whatnot. It wasn't until we took Eric's older brother, Derek, that it got crazy. By this time, we'd visited the house a few times and become numb to the banging and throwing. We found it more amusing than anything, like, check this place out, it's haunted. This time, it got more aggressive. After touring the house and seeing Derek freak out, we decided to have a chat in the kitchen. I was standing in front of the windowing, leaning against the windowsill. Eric was to my right, leaning against the wall, and Derek was standing across from me, in front of the doorway that leads into the second living room that I mentioned earlier. We talk about how scary the house is and all that. Derek turned around to check out the living room behind him. We mentioned to him that that's the hutch we found Eric's knife on after running around the whole house searching for it. As he turns to face me, Derek fell into the room almost like something pushed or dragged him from behind. I remember looking at his face and seeing a look of terror as he tried to grab on for dear life to the doorway. But the push or pull was too strong and he fell on his ass into the room, but immediately jumped up and ran over to me. He grabbed me by my shirt and started screaming at me. Yo, what the hell is your problem? Why did you push me? I just kept telling him that I didn't push him and Eric jumped between us and confirmed what I was saying. He didn't push you. You fell in. Derek explains that someone or something pushed him in. After that, he obviously wanted to leave. So we all agreed, but before we leave, Eric and I both told Derek to check his pockets to see if anything was missing. Of course his pocket knife is missing. But it's okay, we found the last one, we'll find this one, right? We searched the whole house, nothing, as expected. Now it's time to check the hutch. First pass, nothing. Second pass, nothing. Third, nothing. Okay, now this knife is really gone. Derek wants one more pass through the house, we agree. We make it to the far room with no luck. We started making our way back to the kitchen with me leading. As I'm coming up to the kitchen, my cell phone light starts to reflect off something shining in front of the door that led me into the front yard. It was the knife jammed deep into the door. There was no way that the knife could have been jammed into the door without any of us hearing it. Derek takes his knife and we leave. I never went back after that. And of all the bullshit that went down in that house, that was a not welcome sign we took seriously. And that's it. That's everything I can remember. Eric moved not long after that, and I moved away at the end of 2009. Haven't seen the house since, except when I tell the story to friends. I'll pull up the house on Google Images. I visit Eric from time to time, and we always talk about what happened there. Thanks again for listening and being open and understanding. My son is a teenager now, but he'll occasionally ask if I remember when he saw the shadows in the glowing man. This all started when he was about three. He'd start crying or yelling for me at night, and when I would check on him, he told me that there was a black watery swirl 
above his bed and it was scaring him. After a few times, he said there was a glowing man in the corner keeping the black water from hurting him. This went on for ages. By the time he was in early elementary, he was scared of the shadow man in the hallway that would look into his room at night. He described him as very tall, with the shape of a hat on his head and red eyes. One night he was spending the night with his cousin, and my brother and sister-in-law informed me that he was terrified of their hallway. He kept telling me the shadow man was there. I'd say he was seven at the time. A friend of mine contacted someone for me and gave me a prayer, I guess that's what it was, to say with him in his room. Since then, he didn't mention it as much. I'm not particularly religious, so I thought it was bogus. But either way, it worked, or my son is a prime example of placebo effect. Like I said, he will bring it up once in a while, but for the most part, it's in the past. He did Google shadow people and swears. That's what the guy in the hallway was. I'd like to also add that my mum refused to sleep upstairs when she visited. Once, when she was asleep up there, she said she heard me coming up the stairs and then stopped outside of her bedroom door. She apparently called for me, but then started scolding me for scaring her. She got up to see and I wasn't there. She went into my room and saw me and my husband sound asleep. This was probably 10 to 12 years ago. She maintained this story up until her dying breath. So a few years back, I had gone out with some friends to the mountains for a camping trip. And by camping, I mean everyone gets drunk or high around a fire in the middle of the woods and then passes out in their trucks. I was always the youngest of the friend group and this took place before I found my taste for mind-altering substances. I'm typically something of a skeptic and if this had happened nowadays, I'd probably blame it on being drunk. But I was stone cold sober the whole time which is why I feel so sure of what I saw. We're all out at the campsite, maybe 10 to 15 of us. I'm sitting on someone's tailgate smoking a cigarette when my friend, let's call him John, comes up to me clearly intoxicated. John was the one I came out to the campsite with, and probably my closest friend out of anyone here. He asked me if I wanted to go on an adventure with him into the woods. I figured that, if nothing else, I should probably go with him just to make sure he didn't drunkenly fall over and hurt himself. Not to mention, even though I didn't drink or do any drugs back then, that didn't mean I was opposed to fun adventures into the forest. So we walked past the tree line that surrounded the campfire and into the dense trees. The moon was out, and it was a pretty clear night, so although it was dark, it wasn't pitch black. We came to a clearing that seemed to be made up of many flashish boulders and rocks. We were looking up at the night sky, and John was drunk talking, and I was listening and nodding along with whatever nonsense he was saying. He sat down on one of the flatter rocks and eventually just laid down and passed out. I tried to jostle him awake, but he just kept mumbling for me to let him have a rest for a while. Since this is usually how John behaves when he's drinking, I complied. I figured I'd head back to the campsite and check on him again in a little bit. I go back, talk to a few people, smoke a few cigarettes, then decided to go back and check on John. Maybe 10 minutes had passed. I'm walking back to the clearing where I left him, and already from afar I noticed that he wasn't in the spot that I left him. I kept going, figuring that he must have gotten up and wandered off somewhere. As I'm walking, I notice a shadow in the shape of a human standing behind a shrub of sorts a few feet to my right. I stop, figuring that it was John messing with me. I said, dude, come on, let's head back to camp, and no response. Then, the stereotypical, please, you're not scaring me, and still nothing. I move closer to the shadow and notice that I can't make out any distinguishable features. No shirt logo, no eyes, or any face for that matter. Just a vacuum of black that stood in the shape of a human, hanging out with me in the forest. I backed away putting it all together that it wasn't John, and I ran back to camp. I checked the truck that John and I drove out in, and there he was, sleeping on the bench seat. I did a quick head count, and everyone that I had recalled being at the camp was still there. 
The only thing that convinces me that this was paranormal was just the sheer absence of light that this thing took the shape of. Just pure darkness. Whenever I tell this story, John always gets the chills imagining that this thing was probably out there with him when he was passed out by himself. The general conclusion was that John had stumbled back while I had left him, and I just didn't notice that he had returned. Like I said, I'm a skeptic, so I always try to rationalize these things. But this is the one experience that I've had that I just can't believe was simply my eyes playing tricks on me. I've heard of shadow people, but I always thought those were just what people saw during sleep paralysis. Not out in the wilderness and fully awake. If anyone could give me an idea of what this could have been, that'd be much appreciated. This experience I actually shared with an old friend of mine who was staying with me for a week. This didn't just happen to me, which actually made it a little less scary for me, since usually stuff would happen only when I was alone. My friend, who I will call L for privacy, had come over during his vacation time from work and decided to stay with me. He was living in a different state at the time. He would visit with his family during the day, then come back to the apartment at night to sleep. Towards the middle of the week, I finally had the day off from work the next day, and we agreed to hang out that night. He picked me up at my job after work. This was around 10 p.m., and we picked up some takeout and drove to the small park in my apartment complex to eat. We walked over to one of the two picnic tables that were at this park. We were there for maybe an hour, just eating our food, reminiscing about old times and just joking around and having a good time. Suddenly, I felt some really heavy energy in the atmosphere. It was a familiar but still creepy as hell feeling. I kind of froze up and got really quiet and had the urge to get up and look around. I ignored what I was feeling, and I stayed sitting at the table. L was now giving me a funny look. He asked me if I was okay and I told him yes. I was starting to get used to this stuff just randomly happening, and I didn't want to make a big deal about it to my friend. I then felt like someone was staring at me from a distance, and I got chills up and down my arms. Apparently my friend had some sort of strange feeling too, because I saw him slightly jump up in his seat at the same time that I got this feeling. We looked at each other, and we were quiet for a few seconds. Then he asked me if I all of a sudden felt cold. I told him yes, I did, and then told him we should go back to the apartment. We got up and started picking up our trash. I walked away from the picnic table and went over to the trash bin, which was to my right, near the sidewalk. I turned around and I see my friend had stopped picking up his trash since he was answering a text message on his phone. Well, right behind him, on the second picnic table was a shadow figure sitting at the table. I froze and was completely getting chills all over. I automatically assumed, because of my sensitivity to these things, that I was the only one who could see it. My friend then noticed that I was staring behind him and he turned around. My friend then jumped back, dropping his phone in the process and ran over to where I was, in a panic. I asked him in a whisper if he could see it, and he whispered back to me, Holy shit, is that real? I told him I could see it clear as day. We both froze up and stood there, super quiet, while this shadow just sat there, not moving at all. This figure had no discernible shape. It was not in the shape of a person or anything. It was just a round black shadow that only had shoulders and a head. As I was staring at it, I started to get a sick feeling in my stomach, and I started to pray silently in my head that this thing would go away. Suddenly, it just randomly vanished. I swear it must have been sitting there for almost the longest two to three minutes of my life. As soon as it vanished, we both ran straight to my friend's rental car, with him briefly stopping to grab his phone, jumped into the car and locked the doors. L started the car and as he was starting to back up out of the parking space, we both heard two bangs on the hood of his car. We screamed and he literally did almost a burnout as he drove away from the park area. He drove fast as hell 
to where my apartment building was, parked in the first guest parking he saw. We then both literally ran, like hell, straight to my apartment. Eventually, after a long while, we both managed to calm down and talk about what happened. I explained to him the stuff that has happened to me since I moved to the apartment. He was completely freaked out and told me to come stay with him at his family's house because he did not feel safe me staying there alone. I explained to him it didn't matter. This stuff happens to me all the time, at random places, and it doesn't matter where I go. After a while of him trying to convince me, I agreed and we stayed at his family's house for the rest of that week. Obviously I had to come back to my apartment after he left. He felt really sympathetic towards me and was genuinely afraid for me. He still lives in another state and calls me every once in a while to check up on me. I, of course, avoided that little park in the apartment complex like the plague after that. So I used to live in a private house. It was a three-family home, but it was shared with other families. I remember the home layout perfectly well. When you walk in through the door, you have the bathroom in front of you and the kitchen to your right. To your left is the large living room and the bedroom after that. The bedroom was small, but it was enough for my small family. There was me, my dad, and my mum. We weren't far from stores. There was like around five stores and two supermarkets. Father was at work doing security or EMS. I don't remember too much what he did. So it was me and my mother. She wanted to go to the market that day, and I was in the bedroom watching TV. We had a high riser, a bed that goes under the other and pulls out when you're ready to sleep, leveling with the other bed. I was sitting on the bottom one when my mother comes into the room asking if I wanted to go with her or stay home. Of course, I chose to stay home because me, a kid, and TV. So my mother gives me the rundown of the rules of her leaving me alone in the house. No opening the door, do not leave the room, and just stay watching TV. Me and your father have the key. My mother leaves the house and I faithfully stay watching the TV after watching her go out of view to the end of the block, which again wasn't far at all. Now I turn and watch TV. Suddenly the TV starts becoming messed up and I start messing around with the bunny ears to realize it's not working. I change the channels and it's all white noise. I hear something. My name. I'm thinking my mother is back and I walked to the bedroom door. I looked ahead and no one is there. My mother had not come back so there should be no one in the house. I stay quiet though in case someone was at the door. Again I'm in the bedroom and I can see straight to the kitchen. I go back and stare at the TV that was no longer showing a picture but just static that seemed to have appeared out of nowhere. But I was a kid so I wasn't sure how TV worked. Again, I heard my name. I turned my head and looked to the bedroom door, staring at it. Hearing my name I was rather shocked since it wasn't my mother's voice and my dad wasn't home. Again, I heard my name and there were steps. but. It wasn't what footsteps should sound like. It wasn't a pitter pat of flat feet. It was a sound of hooves, like a horse, but slowly, with caution, as if aware. Thunk was one step after my name was said. It wasn't a firm voice. It was more of a whispering call, as if luring someone. I stand up and walk again, slowly this time, towards the bedroom door and look out, looking straight ahead towards the living room, the bathroom and the kitchen. I could see half the fridge as it was there, casting a shadow from the light that came from the window. Thonk thonk. The hoof noises happened again, and slowly the shadow of the fridge moves. I just thought someone was in the driveway moving around, until I saw the shadow form. It was next to the fridge, and there was a shadowy figure, kind of skinny the upper body slightly arched forward, the head shaped like a triangle with a sharp chin and two long pointy things coming from the head. It looked like a person just standing there, but not physically. The bottom was of two legs, but the legs weren't straight. 
They were arched back, like an animal on hind legs. I didn't know what I was looking at, but I just stared at it. It stood still, but you could hear a horse, slowly walking, till it was starting to strut faster. My name whispered again, as I stood in fear at the door, for a split second before running into the room and hiding under the bed. I stayed there, hearing the hooves getting closer, but it was sounding like it was passing through the bathroom, and just going through the living room. My name still being whispered, I started crying, not sure what was going on, and suddenly, just like that, you heard the keys to the door unlocking it. The hoofs stopped, the whispering died and the TV was back to showing whatever show was on for that channel. When the door opened, I ran so fast and hugged the hell out of my mother. I cried so hard and my mother thought someone did something to me, but I didn't know how to explain it. So I told her I was scared and she said, well I told you I was going to the supermarket and you wanted to stay. That's all I was able to say to her when I didn't understand anything. This was my very first memory of my seeing and hearing of the paranormal. Years later, I've seen the depictions of how religions had seen the devil, and I saw it looked exactly like the image of the shadow that had first appeared itself to me. But by then, I had already seen so much, and admitting that you might have seen the devil at six years old wasn't really on my mind to tell anyone. But yes, my first paranormal experience was a shadow of the devil himself. I'll preface this by saying I've enjoyed reading the posts here lately, as I feel they confirm I'm not crazy. I've always had an interest in the supernatural, perhaps because I like a good scare, but also because it confirms what I already know, that there are unexplainable things out in this crazy world of ours. The events I will describe in this post occurred from between the ages of 9 to 19 when I moved out as soon as I could from my parents' home. I didn't move because I had disagreements or arguments with my parents. Aside from a few hormonal teenage years, for the most part we had a great relationship. I could talk about almost anything with my parents and them me. I especially have a strong bond with my mother because my father worked hours away most of my life and we would spend hours sharing our paranormal experiences with each other. I have no recollection of anything remotely paranormal until my family decided to move to a rural town in Georgia when I was around nine. Keep in mind I had much fresher memories in the past but it's been around five years since I moved out and these experiences were a normal occurrence for 10 years of my life. I won't say they were ever routine as I was always terrified of seeing the shadow people, but it became something I routinely expected and feared. Apologies for the long backstory, but I feel it better sets the stage for my post, and these encounters are something I have not shared aside from a few close friends and family. The first encounter I had with the shadow people was completely unexpected and completely caught me off guard. I was around nine and helping my mum with laundry. It was midday and a normal sunny day. Totally not the setting for anything scary. The laundry room was off a main hallway that ran from two bedrooms in the back of the house which contained my bedroom and my brother's bedroom and led to the living room with the kitchen and dining room jutting off of it, as well as an extra entertainment room, eventually ending in my parents' room which had its own master bathroom. I had a basket full of laundry about to bring it to my mother so we could fold it, when as I began to step into the main hallway, a black mass ran right in front of me. It was black and a blur. It seemed to run extremely fast in front of me and into the wall at the end of the hall. I was shaken up, but just explained it to my mum who listened attentively and reassured me it probably was just my imagination. A few days later I was brushing my teeth and getting ready for bed when I put my toothbrush down and turned only to find a black figure was staring at me. We were eye to eye and I was petrified. It disappeared after a few seconds but it felt like an eternity. 
I remember feeling an oppressive feeling in my room constantly. It was like, instinctively, I knew something was watching me. I remember playing hide and seek with my brother for maybe 20 minutes, max, before the feeling of being watched was just too much, and I'd give up and rejoin him, so I didn't feel as scared. I would hear my mother calling and I would get up to answer her, and she would tell me she didn't call me and we'd laugh it off. I remember one night walking up to get a glass of water and seeing my brother. I called his name because I was feeling scared and having a companion on this late night endeavor would be comforting. My brother just kept walking. I thought he didn't hear me, so I called his name again and reached out for his shoulder. He turned around and it wasn't him. It looked identical, but it wasn't. I don't remember what set me off to the fact that it wasn't him. Maybe it was the eyes or the face. It was so long ago that I just remember it happening. And then, it disappeared. I ran to our shared room where my brother was asleep. I confided in my mother, who mentioned that early in the mornings when she was making coffee and getting ready for our morning routine, she would occasionally hear the sounds of children playing and hiding, and would call out our names to no response. She was very supportive and firmly believed in the supernatural. The years that followed were full of short sightings of shadow people on and off. My mother and I would collaborate our stories. I had moved back into my old room and my brother his by this point and the oppressive feeling was just a part of life. My father even told stories of seeing a man in their room at night but he was a very skeptical man and would only tell my mum vague details and then quickly state he didn't remember what she was talking about. We'd occasionally hear footsteps and what sounded like something heavy smashing into the back end of our house and see figures, but I feel like the shadow people either slowed down or my memories faded because the occurrences were so normal. That was until my memory of them resumes and is much worse. The shadow people I would see were much taller. My mum and I noted that perhaps they were in some sort of hibernation soaking up negative emotions because the previous shadow people were more akin to the size of children. The oppressive feeling was back and much worse. I began to have violent nightmares. I would dream of a black being on my ceiling attacking me, attacking my dog. I began to see the beings more regularly and I eventually began sleeping on the couch in the living room and almost completely avoided my old room. But this did not stop the feelings of being watched and the nightmares. I vividly remember walking up drenched in sweat and gasping for air after one particularly vivid nightmare where the black being was above me, sucking what I presumed to be my life essence out of me. I lived my life at home with constant fear. I avoided my home as much as I could. I suffered from horrible insomnia. Eventually we cleansed the house. At first we tried sage but... That only seemed to anger the shadow people more. They lashed out harder. So, we had a priest provide us with holy water and holy oil. I felt that I would have to be the one to cleanse our home, as I was the main focus. My family saw the beings on occasion, and I don't think my brother saw them at all. So I proceeded to cleanse the house. Things were quiet after I did the cleansing. Until one night, when I had a new nightmare. I dreamt of a completely burned man. I could make out every horrible detail in his burned flesh. He still had his eyes and teeth and he was just staring at me and smiling a creepy grin. I woke up mortified but I interpreted the dream as more of a I have to leave now but I'm not finished with you. Apologies for the long rambling post but I thought I'd share. My family home was built when we moved. Before we moved in the land was covered in trees and my family purchased 30 acres of woods and creek to build their house aside from a small house next door that came with the purchase. We stayed there while we waited for the land to be cleared and a home to be moved there. My dad stated a man was murdered in the first home because he was in with some shady characters but aside from news articles and town gossip we never actually found out much. I should mention there was no activity at the other house aside from some creepy vibes and sometimes after it was left vacant or when I'd get home from school. 
I heard voices inside and out, but couldn't make out words. It sounded like a male and female talking, but they'd be quiet as soon as I started making noise in the house. Also, my mum would have strange dreams, but they weren't malevolent. On one occasion, she mentioned she had dreamt of a young boy who was dead and buried at the back end of our home. This happened when I was 24. It was a truly frightening experience. I'm a female and back in those days, I was working in an office. I was living alone in an apartment block. All I used to do was go to work and then go home. Life moved in a monotonous circle. One day, as I was passing by the front of the local train station, a man called out to me. He was wearing a suit, a real ladies man. It broke up the routine of my mundane life. It was refreshing to be hit on. Since I had nothing better to do that day, I decided to accept his invitation to go out for a drink. But I reminded him that it would be just a drink and nothing more. He was a little older than me. I'd say about three years or so. We got on like a house on fire. So after a few dates, he offered me a relationship and we became a couple. He was very witty and really fun to be around. It was about two months into our relationship and it was the first time I invited him over to spend the night. I bought some alcohol and some snacks since it was Friday and I was eagerly awaiting his arrival. We set a time for him to come over and that time had passed. He hadn't texted to say he was running late or anything. Strange. One hour passed, then another, and before long it was night. I looked out the window into the night sky wondering what had happened. An abrupt knocking came at the door. It was loud enough to make me jump. I wondered if this could be a courier or something at the door. I remembered that I hadn't ordered anything though. Rarely people come to the door without being buzzed into the building. It was weird. I guessed it must be my extremely late boyfriend. So I headed to the door. Can I come in? It was his voice, but... Something told me not to open the door. How did he get to my door without being buzzed in? I really can't say why, but I really didn't want to open that door. Can I come in? Can I come in? He asked the same question despite the fact that I didn't respond. Can I come in? Can I come in? Can I, Can I come in? Can I come in? Can I come in? I didn't reply to him, yet he continued to ask to come in. It was his voice, but... It sounded like it was a recording of his voice, and it sounded like it was being played repeatedly. I hated it. I covered my ears. It was so creepy. I couldn't tell you how long it went on for. All I remember is when the voice finally stopped. I didn't know what to think. I was in a panic, so I called my boyfriend again and again, but he wouldn't answer. He never returned my calls, and I never saw or heard from him again. I didn't know his address. I couldn't contact him in any way. I didn't know where he worked or anything about his family. I realized I knew barely a thing about the man, and that freaked me out a bit. I often wonder about what happened to him, and where he is today. I sometimes wonder if he was even human. It feels like it was just a glitch in the matrix sometimes. One thing for certain is, I'm really glad I listened to my gut and didn't let him in to my apartment. I've been thinking about it a lot lately. I call it the mimic. When I was 17 for almost a year, almost every time my mum and sister were out of town for the day shopping and I was home alone, I'd hear it. Keys jingling in the front door, the click of the lock, the scrape of the door sliding open and closed as the dogs rushed to the front door, barking to greet whoever just came home. I'd hear my mum or sister tell the dogs to stop and that they live here and the dogs would stop barking and go about their business. I would get up and go to say hi and go to help put things away and nobody would be there. It stopped happening once I started staying in bed and calling my mum to see where they were instead of getting up to greet them. Once, 
After my mum had surgery, she was staying at her parents' place for a few weeks to heal. I brought my dog for a walk, and when I came home, my mum's dog, who was asleep in her room, started barking. I heard my mum tell her, Shelby, stop barking. And after a few more barks, she listened and stopped. I ran to my mum's room to say hello. I hadn't seen her in a few weeks at that point and didn't know she was coming home, but her room was empty. I still don't know what it was or why the dogs listened to the disembodied voice. I don't know why it was stealing my family's voices. A lot of other things happened at that apartment, from knocking in the walls to claws scraping down my closet door. In the same apartment, my sister had just left to her boyfriend's and my mum was at work. I started feeling sick one day. I grabbed a banana and went to my room to try and feel better. Almost as soon as I got on the bed, I heard a knocking coming from inside the walls. I could replicate it exactly by knocking my knuckle against the wall. I called my sister crying because I didn't know what it was, and she came home. But just before the front door opened, the knocking stopped. She made sure I was alright and then left again, and everything was quiet. I stood up to go throw away my banana peel, and as I was walking past my closet and out of my bedroom, I heard one final knock in the walls. A few months later, I rearranged my bedroom and set up a little reading corner where I was leaning against my closet in a little blanket nest I made on the floor. It only happened when I was leaning against the door for over 20 minutes. But any time I would be reading in my little nest, I would hear and feel the vibrations of the door rumbling against my back. What sounded like claws dragging down the inside of the closet door, trying to get out. It only happened three times before I rearranged my room again. This time, I put my bed against the closet door so anything in there couldn't get out. Mind you, my closet was completely full to the top. A kitten couldn't fit in there. So I don't know where the sound was coming from, but it certainly wasn't in the three garbage bags pressing against the door. I still heard things coming from my closet after moving my bed against it, but I felt safer knowing it couldn't get out. I still don't know what was in that apartment, but I'm glad it didn't follow me when I left. I am a security guard, and this happened about half a year ago. Something or someone turned up during my shift, and I can't really explain it. Like I said, I am a security guard. I don't work supermarkets, factories or events. I patrol a number of contracted properties, so more often than not, I am patrolling a school, elementary schools and high schools mainly. The shift usually starts at either 9 or 10 p.m., because occasionally some of the students have events or teachers working late. Things like that. It's never great if staff are on site. Well, I don't think so. I prefer the solitude. You might imagine that I'm walking around the school grounds as my patrol, but my company doesn't ask that of me. I'm not sure what other companies are like. My job is patrolling inside the school. This would involve going around and making sure all the valuables like the computers and gym equipment are all locked away and no windows or any other access points are left open. I would usually go outside at some point but most of the night is indoors which isn't too bad on a rainy night. One bad thing about school buildings is that they are often long and shaped like a capital letter H. It takes a little bit of time to do a full lap of them. Anyway, now that I've set up the scene somewhat Let's get back to the story. This someone or something that turned up on my shift wasn't following me around. It was outside of the school grounds. In short, it was going along behind the fences and walls around the school. At first, I thought that it was for sure a human's footsteps I was hearing. But then things got strange. The school's fences and walls are all uneven. It was a weird school. They even had stairs on the outside of the buildings. It would take about an hour to go around the school from outside the walls. So when I went outside, I heard these footsteps following me. Every step I took was mirrored by this unseen person or thing. There were times when 
They should have gone faster or slower since they were behind the wall. But they didn't. They just copied me. I mean, these footsteps weren't causing me harm, but they were kind of freaking me out. I can't really complain or do anything about it because whatever was beyond those walls and fences didn't show much interest in coming in here. Besides, if there is someone out there at night copying my movements, do I really want to tick them off? I would rather at least be able to hear where they are rather than not. It happens a lot recently, every time I work at that school to be honest, and I've begun to understand that there is a kind of pattern to those movements that only seem to come when I am on shift. I've asked the other employees at my company and they haven't heard any footsteps. The footsteps can only be heard from 11pm onwards when the school's outer lights go off. These floodlights are set on a timer and they shut off at exactly 11pm. The footsteps never come on nights when it rains. I've shone my light at the fence where I heard the footsteps a couple of times and when I do that I hear a huge thud crash against the fence and then the footsteps just resume mimicking me. Like I said I can't do much about a person outside of the school grounds walking around. As long as they stay out it's not my problem. My worry is that one day something's going to happen. The school faces the woods on most sides so there are many places for the owner of those footsteps to come from and run to. I get freaked out when the school gate is open and I have to go and close it. I wonder if something is going to come out of the dark charging towards me and what it might look like. I think it's human though, which makes this much more unpleasant. I wish I had an ending for you but I don't. It just ends with me hoping the footsteps will stop one day, or at least continue to stay away from the school. This story happened at one of my more recent job places. Sit tight, this one still gives me the chills. I worked at a boarding facility for dogs and cats. From day one, stuff was off. The first thing I noticed, weird, was hearing a voice right behind me. And when I turned around, seeing no one there. Understandable enough, with 20 to 70 dogs barking all around me for their lunch or playtime or potty breaks. I kept disregarding these things until one day, from the top of a low kennel, a partially filled water container, like the ones you use to water plants with and we used to fill water bowls, flew at me. No way a dog could have hit it and sent it somehow flying horizontally at me. It missed me by an inch or so. I felt the breeze of it flying past me as I walked by and it hit the kennel across from where I was located, hard. I knew something was up there, but still hadn't paid it much mind. Shortly after I noticed the metal doggy doors that led from each kennel to an outside run would start swinging when I entered the kennel to clean, or for anything really. I would look at the doggy doors on both other sides, no motion from them. If I stepped out of the kennel, the door would stop swinging. One day a co-worker got mad at me and called me. She said she saw me through the window and asked why I didn't go back and talk with her for a bit. I answered with the fact that I wasn't, nor had I been, anywhere near work that day. She thought I was kidding, went to the front desk to ask, and was told that no one, in fact, had been through at all in the past couple of hours. This happened three times with different co-workers, where they all would see me from another room or yard, and ask why I never stopped to talk, on days I wasn't at work. This eventually progressed. I was moved up to being the bather for our location, so a lot of dog baths and loud dryers going for the pups, and I kept seeing every time I was bathing a dog, my manager and then friend, and also the person whose voice I heard the most when no one was near me, standing by my side. She would stand there waiting for me to turn around and turn off the dryer so I could hear her, and once I did and turned towards her, no one was there. She would be busy with clients, or not even in the building. At this point, some of us girls had already been discussing the weird stuff going on. One friend and I said, roughly at the same time, of oh, the mimic, imitator? 
We looked at each other and smiled nervously. We had never talked in depth about this stuff because, come on, how many people would even take us seriously? It turns out two other girls had heard or seen me or my manager more than once when we weren't there, or it wasn't us. Two more things stuck in my memory about this place. One, we had a storm which led to power flickering on and off. From reception to the back kennel area, where most of the activity seemed to happen, was visible through a large window so clients could see where their fur babies would be kept. As the lights flickered, three of us stood in reception, past our shift in case we had an emergency. Two of us were facing that window. Both of us, at the same time, saw a fast, non-identifiable shadow thing rush past the window, even higher than the top of the kennel doors, which, by the way, are six feet tall. We saw this twice during the light flickers. The second thing that struck was this. We had radios. We just often forgot to use them or even turn them on. One of my co-workers was outside with the daycare dogs. Dogs there just to play for the day. When her radio clicked, a voice she did not recognize said, Spot's mum is here for pickup, and cut out. She went to answer, only to realize her radio wasn't on. She got that dog ready and took him to the front, where the receptionist said she didn't call for him. She didn't have any radios on either. We still don't know what it is or was we experienced, but we do know it was out of the ordinary. When I was in the first year of high school, I used to love going fishing. I was really into mountain stream fishing. I would always try to catch iwana. It's a kind of rock fish out here in Japan. This type of fish is very sensitive. If it gets the slightest indication that there are humans around, it will dart off. This means that fishing for this rock fish must strictly be a solo venture. If I saw another angler nearby, I would always find another body of water to fish in. I was serious about my hobby. The fishing spots I used were about 20 minutes off the normal footpath in the woods. Well, more like the mountainous woods. So after school on the day before I intended to fish, I would always head up there. I would wrap a thread around the trees, over bushes, across boulders, any place anyone could gain entrance to the streams. I would do this to know where the quiet fishing spots were. The thread was incredibly thin, barely visible and it would always break on impact. I was certain that no one would get hurt. So the next day I rode my bike into the woods. I went around checking all the thread I had set up and smiled when I found an area which didn't have a break in the thread. I broke the thread myself and squeezed and ducked my way through all the forest obstacles and headed down to the stream. I started fishing almost immediately. There was a problem though. I could hear voices upstream. Someone was making a hell of a noise up there. Seemed weird, because of the effort I had to go to, to get down here. We were deep in the forest. The trees were thicker, and there were boulders everywhere. It didn't seem like a place people would come to play. The thread wasn't broken either. They must have been crazy to be playing out there. They were getting to me. I really wanted peace and quiet to catch this goddamn rockfish. They were ruining it. At points it sounded like their laughter and screams were all around me. After a while it sounded like their voices were headed further away and I thought that I might still get a chance to do some fishing. I wanted to get on with it. The sun was beginning to set. Just as soon as I resumed, a bunch of dead leaves started flowing down the stream, enough to literally cover the whole surface, rendering fishing impossible. What are you doing you idiots? I thought. I was really angry. They scared away any fish that might have come back. I felt for certain that these people were messing with me and laughing at me. I couldn't see them though. I suspected it was a bunch of guys, so I held off shouting what I was thinking. Who knows how many of them could have been out here. It's never a good idea to tick off a bunch of unseen people in the woods either, right? But to satisfy my own curiosity and to find out what these people looked like and what the hell they were doing. I decided to creep up the river towards where I heard all the noise. 
At points, it sounded like my friends from school, and I couldn't believe that they would be out here doing this to me. Well, maybe it's a prank, I suppose. I can't be sure, but I thought I heard my name at one point, too. I climbed up a very narrow rocky path littered with trees and bushes alongside the stream. The trees totally surrounded me on either side. I felt like I was on a jungle expedition, like in the movies or something. As I grew closer, amidst the sounds of the voices, which still sounded like my friends, was a lone, strong female voice. Then the male voices faded away, like they weren't even there in the first place. Like... It had changed. It was strange to think of a woman now, alone in here. To get to wherever she was, you would probably have to walk in the river at points. I could do this easily as I was wearing my fishing gear. Stranger still, why did she come all the way out to the woods just to act so creepily? When I thought about it, all the noises suddenly stopped. To be suddenly plunged into silence after all that was very jolting. I was getting scared now. I said to myself, enough, let's get out of here. I turned around and started moving quickly back the way I came. I started to hear something splashing behind me. I quickly realized that it was heading right towards me. I was terrified. I broke into a full-on sprint, weaving in and out of the trees and boulders. I got back to my fishing gear and ran straight past it, almost tripping on my tackle box. I ran back to the main path where I had set up the thread. As soon as I had a path out of there, I looked back despite my fear. I wanted to see what had been chasing me. I saw a horrible, dark shadow between the trees, hunched and facing my direction. I swear, it was looking at me, but I couldn't make out where its eyes were. I froze my tracks. I was so frightened. I just couldn't move. It then moved its elongated body back down towards the stream. I never set foot in those woods again. I didn't even go back for my fishing equipment. It was a real shame to lose it all, especially since I was young, but I just couldn't face going back there. I literally have no clue what that thing was. I'm all ears to any suggestions. Was it a ghost? Maybe some kind of cryptid? How did it mimic all those voices? I think about it all the time. It's the scariest thing that has ever happened to me. This happened when I started living alone. Not long after I just moved in, I think it must have been the first week, I found out that my new apartment was in the path of an oncoming typhoon. That night I had gotten off to sleep alright, but I awoke in the middle of the night to hear the sound of the wind and rain lashing my windows. It was so loud, I just couldn't get back to sleep. I was lying there in bed, thinking about nothing in particular when I heard. It was coming from the front door. It was the doorbell. Who the hell would be ringing the doorbell of my new apartment? I asked myself. I crept downstairs and took a look through the peephole. There was a person out there. I was freaked out, but I asked, Who is it? I heard the fear in my voice. Hey, it's me, man. It was my friend. Literally my best friend. He was one of the only ones who knew my address. Why didn't you just tell me you were coming, man? It's like the middle of the night, I said through the door. I tried to get a look at him, but it was dark, and he had his hat pulled down. That didn't matter since we were friends. I mean, it was a little weird, but I have known him for years. Hey, you did really well to get here in this storm, dude. I called out as I started to unlock the door. That was the moment that something dawned on me. Best friend or not, why is he out here, barely talking, and how did he make it here? I could still hear the ferocity of the typhoon against the front door. Another odd thing, he didn't have a driver's license. Even if he somehow caught a bus, he would have had to walk for a long while. I didn't know the area all that well, but it seemed a bit too late for buses. Besides, who turns up in the middle of the night during a typhoon, unannounced? These all were red flags, and I didn't like it. What the hell was this? 
I brought my eye closer to the peephole. Hey, bud, how did you get here? I asked cautiously. We fell into an awkward silence while the typhoon raged on. I brought my eye closer to the peephole. I wanted to catch a closer look at him. His skin was disturbingly pale. It reminded me of a waxwork skin. His eyes flitted back and forth, as if they were remote controlled. That wasn't my friend. I wasn't even sure that was a human. It was pretending, whatever it was. I didn't let on that I was scared, but I was petrified. I watched that thing out there, which looked like my best friend, stand there and smile inanely, occasionally twitching at the corners of its lips. I had to get away from the door once I saw that. I went into another room and tried my best to compose myself and tried to think about what to do next. All the while that friend thing repeated the same line it delivered earlier, as if it was all it knew, like an actor practicing lines. Hey man, it's me. Hey man, it's me. Hey man, it's me. I called my friend, the one it was impersonating. He said it wasn't him. I knew it wasn't him, but I just had to be 100% sure. That thing was very convincing. I went upstairs and went back to bed, but sleep wouldn't come. I didn't know how long the thing stayed outside my door, but I heard it occasionally, repeating its line. Hey man, it's me. After a sleepless night, the sun rose and the typhoon subsided. It took a while for me to get the confidence to approach the peephole, but when I did, I found that it was gone. This was one of the strangest investigations of my career as a paranormal investigator. I was contacted by a middle-aged couple regarding problems with a car, overriding the operator's driving commands. The car was recently given to their son by the parents of a deceased teen. The deceased person was actually their son's best friend who was killed in a vehicle accident when the two had exchanged cars for the night. Their son had a new Jeep Cherokee that his friend wanted to use to go on a date. While on said date, the friend was involved in an accident with a drunk driver and perished. The deceased boy's parents signed over the title of his Toyota pickup, both as a general gift and to replace his vehicle that was totaled in the wreck. I investigated the car with the help of a Toyota mechanic. He checked all systems including the computer, braking, engine and all sensors. Nothing was found. I drove the truck for two days on my normal daily routine with my DVR, EMF meter, camcorder and dash cam running. No evidence collected. I returned the vehicle with my findings that I did not believe the vehicle was haunted. Six weeks later I was again contacted by the couple. The father was using the truck when suddenly the vehicle made an abrupt right turn locked up the brakes and went into a ditch. At the same time, a car driven by a drunk entered the road from a side street without stopping and proceeded to slam into a tree. All of this was witnessed by a sheriff who just happened to be nearby running radar. The drunk driver sustained minor injuries and the father was unhurt. I was provided with the sheriff's number and asked to call him. When I called and told him what I was calling in reference to, he was happy to share not only a reading of the report that he filed, but also information he said that he could not include in the report. His report stated that while conducting normal duties, he witnessed a Mustang run a stop sign at speed and turn onto the road, fishtailing and tires squealing. Almost immediately, it left the road and slammed head on into a tree at approximately 45 miles per hour. He checked the accident victim and found him unconscious and with a minor trauma to the forehead. There was an open bottle of vodka spilling on the passenger seat. The following is the sheriff's statement not included in the report. I was parked facing an oncoming pickup truck. When I witnessed it, lock up its brakes and make a sharp right turn into the ditch. My initial thought was that it was stolen and the driver panicked when he saw me. Before I could react, the Mustang entered from a side road about 50 feet in front of me 
and turned toward the pickup which had entered the ditch about 200 feet before it would have reached the side road. The driver of the pickup could not have seen the Mustang's approach due to trees and brush obscuring his line of sight. If he had not turned into that ditch, there would have been an unavoidable impact between the two vehicles. How he knew to react the way that he did is beyond me. The driver's statement to me was that he did not perform the action. The truck did it by itself. My team was contacted by a writer who claimed to be experiencing a haunting from one of his lead characters. The haunting was witnessed by multiple people, including his wife, children, four neighbours and his mailman. The main haunting was centred around the writer, who we felt had put himself in character too much. This is a fairly common occurrence when someone is constantly working on a developing character, be it an actor, writer or person who overly identifies with a fictional character. What was strange was that first the family, then friends and neighbours, and finally the postman, met the character. The writer began having the experience of the character, which we will call Don, actually talking to him and helping him with the book. He said that Don provided information such as looks, traits, and how he would respond in a given situation. All of that can easily be explained by the writer getting too much into the character and losing his personal perspective. Where it got strange was when the writer's wife and children began to experience Don in real life situations. The wife met Don at the grocery store when he approached her and began flirting. She met him again in a coffee shop and he bought her coffee. She told her husband about this and, of course, he asked the normal questions. How old is he? What does he look like? And more along the same line. Upon hearing her answers, he took her to his computer and showed her the same information about Don as she had just revealed. The children were next to meet Don. It happened at the park and Don purchased ice cream for several of the children there. We were able to verify this through the kids and two parents who were present and gave permission for him to pay for their kids ice cream as well. One of the parents had an extended conversation with him about current events. The neighbours asked the writer how long Don would be visiting out of the blue. Evidently Don had met them out in their yard and accepted when they invited him over for coffee. He had introduced himself as an old friend of the writers from college. While having coffee, he had even shared anecdotes from their college days, including what a player the writer was and what a nice car that he had. The information turned out to be accurate and was somewhat embarrassing to the writer. Finally, the mailman mentioned to the writer's wife that Don had offered him a cold bottle of water the previous day when he had delivered their mail. With all this adding up, the writer called us to investigate. As stated, we were able to verify all of this through first-person interviews. We conducted a complete investigation with no results. We performed a second investigation in the home with the writer present and did get some rather strange results. We all heard Don call the writer from the computer room while we were all in the living room. We got anomalous readings on the melmeter as well as fluctuations in temperature. At one point, we all smelled clove cigarettes which Don smoked in the book. Nothing was conclusive though as to what exactly the phenomenon was that we were dealing with. It continued for several months after we were notified, during which time we conducted three more investigations and interviewed everyone who reportedly had an experience with Don. All phenomenon came to an abrupt halt when the writer out of sheer desperation killed off Don in the book. There have been no more experiences or signs of Don since. I received a call from a couple who had recently purchased a new home and were having strange events occur in their barn. The backstory on this property is that the original home was built in the 1840s. 
The barn was added a few years later, but there was no record. The original house burned down in 1976, and a new one built on the old foundation in 1981. Upon arriving, I noticed the property was impeccably kept, and although it was very rural and set far back off the road, a driveway was added and paved to the house. This was unusual for the area, and indicated to me a level of sophistication to the owners. In other words, they were most likely not from a rural area. I was greeted at the door and invited in by a young couple that I would guess to be in their mid-twenties. The home was as well kept and clean on the inside as it had been on the out. We chatted for a few moments and they insisted that I see the barn. I noted that there was absolutely no feelings or atmosphere in the house. I then followed them to the kitchen and the back door. There was a kitty fence blocking the entrance of the kitchen preventing four miniature goats from exiting the kitchen. This was a shock since I had judged these people by what I had witnessed up until this point. When I asked about the goats in the house, I was told that they had no choice because whatever was in the barn tried to kill them. They had lost two goats already and the vet told them that they were most likely frightened to death. Approaching the barn you could see that they had been at work putting their decorative style here also. From the outside there was a new fence surrounding the front and creating a small yard of about a quarter of an acre. It was clean and recently raked. The barn was in the style of an old tobacco barn that had been repurposed and painted. As we entered I noticed that the hair on my arms immediately stood up. I definitely sensed something there. I asked them if there was a specific area where there seemed to be more activity. I was shown the milking room that they had set up. The man told me that once he built the milking stall, everything started. I asked for some time to poke around by myself and noticed that they practically ran out. I walked around the milking room for about an hour. That was a lot since it was a small room. On the opposite side of the barn, I found another room slightly larger than the milking room. It had a concrete floor and freshly panelled and painted walls. It had electricity, a sink and some equipment that I recognised as being used to make cheese. The room did not interest me at all. It felt sterile and uncomfortable, like an operating room. I was sure nothing was lurking there. It wasn't until I was walking around in the stable area that I really felt something. This part of the barn had only a dirt floor and although it was raked clean, it did not feel that way. I'm not a psychic, but I've learned to pay attention to my body and my impressions. To be honest with you, all that I wanted to do in that area was rake it clean myself. Perplexed, I summoned the man and asked him if he had found anything in that area. He seemed slightly embarrassed as he explained that along the wall there had been a deep trench with something that looked like a pile of old leather that had been folded and stacked at one end of it. He asked me not to tell his wife, but he had just covered over it instead of removing it as he had just felt like it was too dirty to touch. I asked for a shovel and assured him that I would not tell his wife and cover it back up when I had finished. He agreed and provided a shovel before hurrying back into the house. Five minutes later I had located the leather. As the man had claimed, it was all dried hard and did look as if it was nothing that anyone would ever want to touch. As I fought to unwrap it, I was struck with a feeling that it may cause me to get sick. I felt nauseated as I handled it. Finally, getting it unfolded, I found a very old memo type book in it. The writing was still perfectly legible. It was a journal, written by a Civil War soldier. As I scanned through it, about half the way through, I found the last page of writing. It had blood on it and said, When you find me and read this, please tell Ma and Pa that I'm sorry. I tried to make it back home, but they caught me. I was shot and I know I will die quick. Please get my body home and bury me by the stream. I live in Savannah. Signed, Jonas. I refilled the hole and took the journal and leather to the front of the house. 
I asked the couple to come sit on the porch so that we could talk. I showed them the journal and suggested that we hold a small memorial service in the barn. They invited the only neighbours they knew and we did just that in the barn by where I dug up the journal. I asked them to take the journal with me and the couple agreed. I took the journal to the Savannah Historical Society and asked if they would keep it on display as a remembrance to a lost son. They agreed and I gave it to them. Three weeks later when I checked back with the couple, I was informed that the goats were back in the barn and there were no issues. I was called by a lady who swore that her cat was possessed. I was incredibly skeptical but very curious. According to the lady, her cat would suddenly start screaming at the top of its lungs. It would do this crazy looking slow motion walk while tilting its head at weird angles. If she tried to approach it, when it did these things it would lash out at her with its claws. After having one of these spells it would hide but not relax. Its tail would swing wildly and it growled to itself for up to an hour. As strange as all of this sounded, I spoke to one of my team members who was very sensitive. After hearing the story, she insisted we investigate. We arrived at the residence at around 4.30pm. The lady gave us a tour of the house and introduced us to the cat. It was a standard 3-2 ranch style home and we found nothing creepy about it. The cat was cool, very affectionate and really took my fellow investigator. She spent a couple of hours alone with the cat while I got the paperwork and formalities done with the lady. She invited us to investigate the home that night as she had a date, then worked the 11pm to 7am shift at the local hospital. She left for her date at around 7.30pm and we began our formal investigation. We moved room to room asking questions in hope for an EVP or at least a knock in response to a question. We had no activity until at 11.30pm, the cat started screaming in the master bedroom. Upon entering the doorway, my partner grabbed my shoulder, stopping me, and motioned finger to lip for me to be quiet and listen. It was hard with the cat screams. They made my hair stand on end. As we watched and listened, a shadow began to form in the corner of the room. There was a whisper coming from the shadow that was not recorded by our DVRs, and we could not understand what was said. The cat was irate. It was scared and ready to fight, so we witnessed the claims of the lady firsthand, and they were exactly as she had described. My partner spoke very calmly to the shadow, saying, You are scaring the cat. I don't think you mean to, so if you leave this room and go to the bedroom across the hall, we will help you. We turned and entered the smaller bedroom and sat quietly on the bed waiting to see what would happen. A few moments later, my partner grabbed my arm and pointed at the doorway into the spare bathroom shared by the two smaller bedrooms. I could clearly see a humanoid shape with no features, but it was blacker than the dark. This teammate and I had worked together many times and had a routine that we followed. I told the entity that everything was okay, the cat's calm now, and we want to know how we can help. It slowly moved through the doorway and slightly into the room. At that point, I heard through my DVR the word Kitty. While recording, I always plug in an earpiece so I can hear what is being recorded in real time. I asked if it was trying to pet the kitty and it stretched out its arm, pointing towards the master bedroom where the cat was. I asked if it wanted to hurt the kitty and almost immediately heard a sigh and whimper. I asked again if it wanted to hurt the kitty and stated that in order for us to help it, it needed to answer. My partner told me a minute later that it answered. She sensed that it indicated that it only wanted to pet the cat. She also sensed that this was the spirit of an adolescent male and she thought that in life he had some type of developmental issue. While we spoke the entity seemed to sway slightly back and forth but it did not go anywhere. It seemed that it was listening to our conversation I once again spoke to it, saying that it had scared the cat and if it wanted to pet it, that it would have to make friends with it. I explained that if it would just sit still and speak to the cat, that it would learn that you don't want to hurt it 
Eventually the cat will come to you and let you pet it. A moment later, the cat appeared in the hall doorway and sat down calmly. No one spoke or even moved, including the spirit. A few moments later, the cat joined us on the bed. I spoke to it calmly, and my partner scratched its neck and head. As I looked back up from the cat at the spirit, I noticed that it was gone. We experienced nothing else that night, and locked up the house and left. Two days later, my teammate called me, very excited. She had researched the property, and found that a young man who had Down syndrome had died on the property when he had fallen out of a tree. We gathered our evidence and met the lady the following day. I played her all of the recordings of us talking to the spirit so that she would understand what exactly had happened. When she heard me tell the spirit how to make friends with the cat, she began to cry. She told us that only that morning the cat was on the bed in a smaller bedroom. It was purring very loud and moving its head like someone was scratching it. I spent many years stationed in Germany. I did two year tours mostly, and each was in a different place. This occurred while stationed in Kitzingen, Larsen Barracks. That base was flanked by forest. There was an old abbey, located a couple of miles away through the forest and was said to be haunted. A couple of other guys in my company were interested in ghosts also. We had investigated a few of the castles around the general area, so when we heard about this place, it was a no-brainer. Our plan was to set up Friday after last formation and make the hike and set up camp. We slept that night and the next morning we went to the abbey. It had been closed for years but it was open during the day for tours. After it closed for the day, no one was supposed to be on the grounds, but that was not enforced nor patrolled. It was basically left open. Upon arriving, we took the tour and learned the history and layout. Around noon, we went back to camp for some lunch and relaxed before ghost hunting around 10 p.m. When we reached camp, it was destroyed. It appeared that some kind of animal had gotten into everything. It threw all our personal stuff from our backpacks all over, tore down our shelter halves, and basically just made a big mess without destroying anything. We cleaned up and reset camp. None of our food was missing, but that wasn't surprising, since most of it was in cans. Surprising was the couple of boxes of crackers and loaf of bread had not been taken or damaged. Around 10 p.m. that night, we went back to the abbey. We investigated it thoroughly inside and out. We never heard or saw anything. We stuck it out until around 4 a.m., hoping something might show up, but nothing did. We made our way back to camp, disappointed and tired. When we got there, that animal had been back. It had done the exact same thing as before, except this time. Those boxes of crackers and loaf of bread were scattered around like everything else. Out of the wrappers and on the ground. We were pretty pissed off. If we'd been able to see to hike out, we would have, but those woods were too dark. Once again, we cleaned up and about an hour before it would start getting light out, we crashed for a few hours. Two hours later, I was startled awake by one of the guys yelling and cussing up a storm. Camp was trashed again and we'd slept through it. Even our shelter halves had been ripped down as we slept under them. The only difference was that our personal items, socks, underwear and t-shirts, were made into a trail leading out of camp. We packed up everything and started following the trail of clothing. When we reached the last of it, there was a small pile consisting of one pair of underwear belonging to each of us, and the crutch had been ripped out of each one. About 100 feet away, we could see the perimeter fence to our base. I never went back into that forest. The rest of the time, I was stationed there. This happened during the December school holiday. My friends and I went out to Orchard for fun. 
We started out in Sinaleja, playing pool. My friends suggested to go for a midnight show, and the rest said okay. We started looking to see which cinema was showing a midnight horror movie. We found out that JE Entertainment was showing one, so immediately we all rushed down. Together with me, there were another eight of my friends. As we purchased the tickets, we requested to sit in a whole row. The ticket seller sold us the second last row of seats. I have no idea whether it was a coincidence or not, because I took a head count before the show started and there were a total of 13 people in the cinema. As you all know, 13 is an unlucky number. During the show I occasionally took a peek at the seats. I noticed that there were more than 13 people in the cinema. But the problem is that during the whole show, there were no other people coming in at all. Which means that, other than the 13 originally, we had company. Furthermore, when the movie reached about halfway, my friends and I heard noises coming from the last row of seats which supposedly was empty. The noise was like the old cinema where people came around checking the tickets and people eating. So I turned back to take a look. The whole row was empty. So where did the noise come from? Nobody knew. I confirmed that it was not from any of my friends. The reason being that none of us brought any food to eat. As soon as the show finished, we rushed out and went home. Since then, I never went back there to catch a midnight show again. Last Thursday, I went to watch a horror movie with my friends. It was a midnight show, and the title of the show was 303. The show was already starting when we came in. We were late for about 10 minutes. And the story was about a college where there have been a murder in the school. There's five junior college boys, and after knowing that somebody has been killed, we felt so scared it was such a thrilling show. We had shivers down our spine, and this show lasted for two and a half hours. It ended at about 2.35 a.m. After the show ended, we decided to go to the toilet. It was quite dark at that moment, so the only persons left in the toilet was me and my friend. But then, we started to hear something weird. We heard a lady laughing and crying all at the same time. We hugged each other. We tried to open the door, but it was locked. We tried shouting for help. And while we were there, we constantly heard the voice. About five minutes later, the voice suddenly stopped and the door opened. We dashed out from the toilet and we are so lucky that nothing terrible happened. On the seventh floor of Plaza, Singapore, there used to stand a gynecological and pediatric clinic. Abortions used to take place there. And hence, when the haunting news came out that the GV cinema that actually stood there today, immediately readers put a connection on it. According to patrons, there is a little girl sitting somewhere near the front rows at halls 7 and 10 during the first or last show, when there are fewer people. Staff working there apparently needed to find the toys they might have placed at the door the previous night. Even taller tales have it that priests have been engaged in performing rituals in the hall. Projectionists working alone at night had purportedly seen shadows in the cinema after all patrons had left. Lifestyle of Straits Times did an interview with its senior manager and they had refuted the claim. I think for economic reasons, it would be silly to admit it, even if the place was indeed haunted. What do you think? There was one haunted cinema building many years ago. It was situated at Jalan Tenkera, Malacca. 
The haunting started as soon as the building was completed and started its operations, and the whole town knew about it. Their cinema has two levels, the lower level and the upper level. On the upper level, there are two seats draped with red cloth, and these are the haunted seats. Many people who sat on these seats experienced scratches on their bodies. Some even come out of the cinema bloody. There were scratches on the faces, necks, and the bodies. It was truly a horrifying sight. There were occasions when people met a long-haired female ghost in the men's room and the toilet lights turning on and off by themselves. Seeing that the stories of the cinema haunting had spread all over the town, a medium was called to pacify the ghost. He performed his rituals and offered some animal blood and draped red cloth under two haunted seats, and those seats were never to be seated again. However, with the advent of VCD and DVD, the cinema went under and was demolished to make way for a new building. Cinemas are rumored to be haunted because of the fact that it is a transitional place. The same as toilets, corridors, and storerooms. Places where people don't spend a lot of time. Of course, another criteria is that it must be dark enough for spirits to lure comfortably away from the sun. The cinema is dark for perhaps 80% of the time when the lights would be off, as movies were being screened. The following story I'm going to relate to you happened to me about 10 years ago at the famous Shaw Tower Cinema. At the time, I was doing a 933 movie marathon because it was having a good promotion. So I joined my friends even though I was extremely tired. It was almost 3am when I went to the ladies room alone. I assumed I was the only one in the toilet because I had seen that all doors of the cubicles were not shut. After doing my business, I was looking at the mirror, and suddenly, I heard the sound of a woman sighing. I then looked around to confirm the entire toilet is empty, and I quickly walked out of the toilet. After sitting down for five minutes, my friend went to the toilet, and she came back too. I then told her I had something to tell her, but I will tell her after the show finished. And she said, I also have something to tell you. So both of us quickly went out and exchanged the stories, and we were telling each other the exact same incident about hearing something and feeling uneasy in the toilet. This story may sound a bit silly, a bit lame even, but I swear it's true. My friends and I had decided to watch a movie at the mall. The movie was Pontiana Karum Sundal Malama. It's quite a new movie. Maybe you've heard of it? Anyway, the mall. Yes, that's the name of the shopping complex. Very creative, right? Well, it's built right in the middle of a busy commercial district. The town center you might call it. It's brand new and just completed this year. As far as I know, no supernatural going-ons have happened in the area. Anyway, as I was saying, we were watching the Pontianak movie, the late night showing. I happened to be at the end furthest from the aisle, and the few seats from mine to the wall were all empty. In the middle of watching the movie, my neck felt kinda stiff. You know how that feels, right? After staring up at the movie for quite a while. So, I stretched out turning my neck from side to side to get rid of the stiffness. But to my shock, the empty seats beside me were no longer empty. There was a lady in a white dress with long black hair sitting there, seemingly absorbed in the movie. I turned back to the movie frozen in terror. But I couldn't stand it anymore and I was about to go crying to my friend who was sitting right beside me but didn't seem to have seen anything strange. 
I glanced back at the extra person, but she was gone. I went crying to my friend anyway. She didn't believe me, but she didn't mind switching seats with me. Needless to say, I wasn't very much interested in watching the movie after that. I mean, who needs a movie when you've seen the real thing? About 30 years ago, I spent several years working in movie theaters in Worcester, Massachusetts. My favorite was the huge old building that had been chopped up into four separate cinemas. It had been a beautiful theater back when it was built in 1926 as the Poly Palace. Although it had been semi-destroyed during modernization in the late 50s, there were still many original features of the building that remained. As a manager, I had been issued a big keychain which gave me access to the entirety of the building and I spent countless hours exploring nearly every part of that building, except the curtain loft, which would have required climbing up an iron ladder about 80 feet. The building had attics and basements and crawl spaces. There was an area in the front of the building on the second floor that had two or three abandoned businesses that had been walled off. There was a music store and a ballet studio and maybe an office. There was also a bathroom. Everything looked like it was from the 1940s or 50s, Faded wallpaper with ballerina motif, a peeling mirror on the wall. In another section of the building was the old manager's office, with high ceilings and crown moulding, and a beautiful stained glass window that, I believe, dated back to 1912, and had previously been part of an adjacent theatre. There was still an old safe in that office. I found a newspaper article in the public library from 1942 or 44 that detailed an armed robbery where two men had tied up the managers in the office and robbed the safe. One of those men was later executed in an electric chair for an unrelated crime. We used the old manager's office to store giant 30-gallon bags of popcorn. There was a sort of crawl space under the box office that was accessible by lifting a hinged plywood panel and climbing over a four-foot wall. On the other side were the remains of a couple of basement rooms with broken concrete and bricks strewn about. In one of those rooms, I found an old flared Coca-Cola glass in perfect condition. I kept it for years. I also found a deck of cards in a handmade leather pouch with a snap closure fashioned out of a buffalo nickel. There were also old dressing rooms with makeup mirrors and light bulbs. The paint was peeling off the walls in potato-sized flakes. As you can surmise, the building was purported to be haunted. The head manager claimed to have had ghostly experiences. I'll start there, I guess. When the building was remodeled in the late 1950s, the men's room in the basement was converted into the manager's office. One night while closing up, the manager, my boss, made his way up the stairs to the main lobby. As he emerged, something caught his eye. Way up by the ornate 30-foot ceiling, he saw an apparition floating there. It disappeared into the ceiling. Terrified, he ran back down the stairs and hid in the office until daylight. Another time, he was again working late. There were several arcade machines in an area of the lobby, and they were normally powered off when the last shows were in. As he climbed the stairs, he heard all of the machines making their electronic bleeps and bloops. He was annoyed that the Ash had failed to turn off the machines before punching out and realized that he'd have to go turn them off himself. As soon as he opened the door, the noises stopped dead. Looking across the lobby to where he emerged, the machines were all dark. They were indeed powered off. The projectionist claimed that he looked out of his booth window one night in the big theater upstairs while shutting things down and saw a face looking in at him. I take those stories with a grain of salt I was always skeptical of those based on the sources. Now, here's my experience. I was obsessed with the history of the building and would research newspaper archives for articles about it. There were rumors that a stagehand had died there in an accident during the time that it had been a vaudeville theater. I was never able to confirm that. I had talked about the building to my mother and she in turn happened to discuss it with a woman that she worked with. 
That woman claimed to be psychic or clairvoyant, or maybe just that she would get feelings about things. She told my mother that she had been to that theatre, and that she felt someone had indeed been killed there, and that his name began with the letter M. My reaction was, <laughs> okay, sure, she sounds nutty. Sometime later, I was the sole manager on duty on a slow night midweek. I was alone in the office in the basement. The seven o'clock shows were in, and I was doing paperwork. The intercom buzzed. It was the box office cashier, calling to tell me that I had a phone call. I asked who it was, and she said that she didn't know. I hung up the intercom and pushed the button for the main incoming line where the call was holding. The earpiece erupted with loud, close squealing and static. I used the word close because it was so loud and distinct that I assumed that it was something wrong with the phone PBX in our building rather than the line itself or the caller's phone. It was just the impression that I had. Hello? I said. Nothing. Just more squealing and static. Hello? I repeated. Hello? A man's voice. Calm. Flat. Distinct. Then nothing further. Who is this? I was a bit perplexed, all of the noise on the line and the caller seemingly reluctant to speak. This is Mike, calm, quiet, not shouting over the noise on the line, quite audible and clear, then nothing but the awful squealing and static. I waited a few seconds for the caller to continue. After all, he called me, presumably there was a reason. Nothing. Mike who? I said, feeling a little impatient. Mike is a common name and there were two Mikes employed there at the time. One of them had a fairly high-pitched voice that sounded nothing like the caller. It didn't sound like the other Mike either. The line abruptly went dead. Silent. The squealing and hissing stopped. I waited. No one called back. I called Sandy, the box office cashier, and asked her if they asked for me personally or just to speak with the manager. She said that the caller had asked for me by name. Suddenly I remembered my mother's friend, a man's name beginning with the letter M, Mike. It never happened again, and the phone never made those noises. No one ever confessed to a prank. I never figured out who it was. This is one of the old cinemas in Singapore. It's still standing there, and I used to work there as a projectionist, and this was related to me by one of the long services colleague of mine. There was a movie playing during the 80s, some sort of Chinese ghost story, The Haunted Towers, and one of the staff decided to play a prank on my colleague. He dressed up in a Pontianak outfit and went to the auditorium, normally after the show, they need to clean the place and clear the rubbish, and my colleague was sweeping between the seats. But suddenly, this guy jumped on my colleague and scared the shit out of him. My colleague was of course pissed, and the following week, the same show was showing again. My colleague was on duty again, and this time after the show while sweeping, he thought that he saw the guy dress up as the lady walking past the auditorium entrance. Thinking that he wanted to give a piece of his mind for what he did last week, he chased after him. He called his name and started to scold him for what he did the previous week. But suddenly, the lady stopped between the staircase, separating the stall and the circle seats. My colleague continuously verbalized the lady with colorful language, and then the lady turned. But when he looked, it was not the guy that scared him last week. Only then did my colleague realize that the lady had no legs and the face. Well, he froze to that spot till he passed out. He was on leave for a few days, and the best part is that the person that scared him the first time was on leave when it happened. Back when I was 17, 
I applied for a job in a spanking new cinema that was new to my city. There was a lot of hype about it as it was a well-known brand and known for being in the upper league of cinemas. I popped along to the interview and to my surprise got a job as a cinema host. My duties involved serving guests, selling tickets, cleaning screens and toilets, basically a bit of everything. I'm a movie nerd. I couldn't wait to start. This cinema was part of a massive regeneration of the city and was welcomed by the whole country for creating job opportunities. Now, where this new complex and shopping mall was built had a bit of history to it. Way back in the day, this plot of land is where public hangings used to happen for convicted thieves and convicts. Some, as young as 9 and 10 years old. In fact, it wasn't until the late 90s or early 2000s that the hanging location was permanently removed and replaced with some modern metal structure. When I say the location was removed, it was a kind of circular platform that was locally called the bandstand. After the bodies were hanged, according to history, they were then wheeled a short walk away and dumped. This is what the cinema and shopping complex was built over. Now you know a little about it, let's move on to the happenings within the cinema, as that's what you're here for. In each cinema screen there was a night vision CCTV installed. It was useful for the ushers spotting teens misbehaving mainly. The cleaners used to be the first ones in the building each morning before our cinema staff would come in. One morning I came in for my shift and a few of the cleaners were sitting around the confectionery tables, trying to calm one of the female cleaners down. She seemed really upset about something, and I assumed perhaps a death in the family. I didn't want to intrude, so went to start opening up the popcorn bins, etc. This is when I overheard one of them say to the other, something along the lines of, she isn't lying, she's telling the truth. I've seen it too. This woman was deeply shaken. I mean, she looked like she had just seen a ghost, as humans would put it. Little did I know, she literally did. Long story short, it all came out that this cleaner had witnessed a ghost in the biggest of the 12 screens. She claims she was cleaning the stairs when she looked up and saw a man sitting in one of the chairs, but she knew he wasn't real. As her story goes, she quickly fled the screen and ran down to the other cleaners, crying. I don't blame her. Myself and another staff member thought it would be a good idea to rewind the CCTV from this screen and see if we could see anything odd. As we did, we watched her clean the steps with a brush and pan. And then you could see her slightly look up at the middle seats, freeze fixated on something for about five seconds, then drop her brush and run out of the screen. What was incredible to see on the CCTV was a sort of mist in the area she was staring at. Me being me, put it down to dust, maybe a glitch in the screen spotlights. But this domestic cleaner was certain there was a man sitting in the screen by himself. The story quickly spread around the cinema to the point our management pulled us all in and told us we needed to stop talking about it and that what happened was a trick of the eye. We didn't dare tell our manager we checked the CCTV as we knew it's not to be used for nosy purposes. Little stories here and there would casually pop up from time to time. The next one was one of the male staff members who worked up in the projection room came running down into the confectionery area one evening and swore someone pushed deeply into his back when he was setting up a reel. He was badly shaken and quite the macho man who used to laugh at us for getting scared of being in certain screens by ourselves. He was in the projection room by himself so there was no explanation for what he felt. I recall seeing management bring him into the office and around 20 minutes later he left and didn't come back to finish his shift. A few days after that, we were told he wouldn't be working projection anymore and instead would become an usher. We were shocked as the pay was a lot less but that's what he did. Someone asked him what on earth happened and he point blank refused to talk about it. Rumour has it that his back was bruised from this firm push but I can't confirm nor deny that, as I never seen it. The cinema was so bright and flashy, 
When it was bustling with the guests, it never had a negative vibe. Or maybe we were all just too busy to notice it. However, the staff only areas had a different feeling to them. And when the guests would leave, the entire place had a different impact on you. It would feel cold. And you ever get that feeling someone could jump out at you at any point? So you're always kind of on edge? That. I would get goosebumps in areas that weren't cold. Shivers in screens as if someone was brushing past me. When I would be standing in them to make sure no one was fooling about. I just keep playing it off as other possibilities, which is what I'm good at doing. One night, I was closing with around seven other team members. I was team leader at this point, hence it being my responsibility to close up. It was around 12 a.m., and I gathered the staff outside of the doors while I was locking the main doors. Just as I was about to do so, we all heard the loud creaking of one of the public bathroom doors open. The creak was long, as if someone was slowly pushing it open. The creaking sound was well known to us, as you'd constantly hear them open and close with guests using them and kids slamming them. Another team member and I dropped out bags and headed into the ladies' bathroom to check it out, assuming a guest had been left behind unwell or there was kids messing about. However, our protocol was to check each screen in public area before confirming with management the cinema was clear. But then again, mistakes can happen. We were heading into the ladies' bathroom, and each of the loo doors was closed, apart from the disabled, a larger one at the very end. It was wide open. I called out hello, but nothing. We both walked down and peered into the cubicle, and there was no one. Confused and freaked out, I decided to call the mall security to check the place for us. Along came three security men, and they checked everywhere. But nothing. No one. All our staff only doors were coded, so no one could run out of them if they were messing about. The door that was wide open wasn't loose. In fact, it was stiff as hell. There were no drafts. Basically, no reason for it to give out this long, chilling creak. We closed up and laughed it off as we went our separate ways. But that particular chill stuck with me each time I'd be in them toilets. You could explain this one as just poor lighting or electric works, but when it happened to you, it was truly awful. When we would load up the trolleys to take the rubbish out, you would bring the trolley down to the basement and out to the loading bay. As you were underground at this point, there were no windows. The long basement corridors had them censored lights that would make clicking sound as they turned on detecting emotion and movement. One evening, myself and my colleague were taking a trolley down each and exited the lift. The lights came on, click, 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 as we walked along. We were chatting about something or another, and the next minute, click, click, click. The lights went out. It was pitch blackness to the point I couldn't even see my colleague. Our work radios that were attached to our belts started giving off the worst feedback sound, so we immediately turned them off. My colleague grabbed my arm, and we both just stood there. I recall rattling the metal trolley to try to get the lights to detect movement, but nothing. I asked her if she had her mobile on her to use as a torch, but she didn't, as we weren't supposed to carry them on us, and mine was in the office on charge. We agreed if this was an electric outage, we should feel the walls to get back to the lift and back upstairs. Now, looking back on the situation, we must have looked like idiots, but we held on to each other and felt the walls back to the lift. Remember, we honestly couldn't see a damn thing. We were in a concrete tunnel with zero light source. We could only see the dim light of the elevator button. We pressed it, and as soon as we did, click, click, click. All the lights came back on. We left the trolleys there and went up and explained what happened. According to mall security, they had no knowledge of an issue with the lights in the basement. Yes, maybe it was just a dodgy coincidence, but it was terrifying. Thank God I had my friend with me, as I think if I had been alone, I would have passed out. Another time I was in a storeroom, sorting through a big delivery early in the morning. 
around 7am. I was the only cinema employee at the time, apart from my manager who was in the office. He was male. My work radio buzzed and a somewhat young female said, Can you come to the basement? It was a voice I didn't recognize, and it was clear as day. The voice said it in a playful way. I stopped in my tracks and headed back to the office, thinking along the way maybe my manager had his kid in. I walked into him, and he looked up at me, as if to say, You good? I asked him, Did he have anyone in the building with him that may have a radio? He didn't. He had a radio on his desk beside his coffee and all the other radios were on the charging stations. I explained to him someone asked me on my radio to come to the basement and in our shock we just laughed. What else do you do? You go to the basement of course. We headed to the basement and no one. We were both totally spooked and at that point I honestly questioned my sanity as I know still to this day what I heard. Other stories from employees I heard, but never witnessed. Staff members seeing shadows in the sections behind the screens, hearing voices next to them when there was nobody there, unsettling feelings when doing fire checks along the fire escape routes, and access codes on doors buzzing to say a code was input wrong, even though no one was trying to use them. Another messed up story from a girl I worked with and that I'm still close to. She was on usher duty one day and a man came out of a screen during a film to tell her that there was a man seated behind him and his wife who kept kicking their chair and whispering. My friend apologized and went in and up the stairs to tell the man to stop. But there was no one there, and no allocated seat purchased for that location. Her and the man assumed he had snuck out. But while checking the CCTV, you can see the annoyed man turn around several times, assuming to tell this man to stop. But on the CCTV there was no one. Was the aggravated man crazy? Or did he really see the ghost of a man sit there? I have no idea. So there you go, that's my experience of working in a cinema built on top of a burial ground for the hanged criminals and thieves of years gone by. I enjoyed my time there, but you couldn't pay me to head back into the basement or screen 12 alone.